You guys mentioned uh, the wondrous, the wondrous joy you guys got from like never in my mind, my my imagination did I think that I would be meeting Neil Gaiman or Isaac Stern. Um, I have similar things in that department too, because never in my life did I think that I would meet Leonard Maltin or get to talk to him these last three years. But never in my life would I have thought that the nine-year-old me would walk into the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle in that theater opening weekend, <laughs> hearing the dulcet tones of our next guest here, and then all these years later getting to meet Bullwinkle himself. Ladies and gentlemen, he is more than Bullwinkle. He is more than even just a voice artist. He is a remarkable author of a wonderful book uh, about the pioneers of golden age animated voiceovers. This is a man who dug deep into the recesses of history and pulled out all the information that anyone could possibly muster. And if you don't believe me, why don't we go ahead and take some time to talk about what he knows about Mel Blanc, B. Benaderet, and all the other voice artists that found their way onto the Benny program. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Scott. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I, I think so. If everybody can hear him okay, um, just let me let just us know, know if I chat. turn it up just a little bit like that. Is that all right? Uh, yeah, I think you're coming in pretty good, my friend. Oh, good. I'm, I'm the world's least technical person, and this is all still new to me, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, great introduction. And gee, I, I, I feel I feel I should speak like this for the next hour, but <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? You know what we didn't plan on doing was like a fake interview with the ghost of Jack Benny, but now, <laughs> I'm, now I've got ideas. <laughs> okay sure no um no but welcome keith um thank you thank you thank you zach it's great to be back again and uh, i do appreciate being invited to this great convention yeah now i i wanted to uh before we get into the chat about jack i wanted i want to take a minute to mention that book that i brought up here because it is mm -hmm. important to our discussion here to i think people should get to know the credentials of the man we're about to talk to um, this is the book right here, Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age, 1930 to 1970. Uh, this is volume one. Now, volume two is very interesting because it's actually the, the full listing of the cartoons that you mention in the book, volume one. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful part of that book is that it goes through the history of animation, studio by studio, there you go. They've got the physical copy. And I've got my Kindle copy, which helped me with, yeah, there you go. There's our boy. There's our boy. That's me, me in 1985 on a radio show with Mel Blank. And it's, I'll tell you, about, uh, tell you about that as we go on. And so, so like, this is the thing that I wanted to bring up to why people should pick up this book. So you, you came on my podcast not too long ago to promote the book. And mm -hmm. I, got, I went ahead and got a copy on Kindle so that I could take notes like throughout like the computer area that I have in here. Sure. And the, we, we ended up centering a lot more on Warner Brothers, uh, Columbia, and um, I believe one other studio. Oh, um, but the point is, is that going through it, I ended up reading it like at least 15 to 20 pages a day during my shifts at work. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm still blown away by how much detail you put into that. Um, as we're going to be talking about Mel and these other voice artists, I want to ask this quick question so that you can like tell the folks what you've been able to tell me before. Um, sure. What what went in, what went in to finding information about people who normally don't get that screen credit like Mel did? Well, it was it was a, a, one of the things that really influenced me in doing and becoming a voice person years ago was the Jack Benny program. Um, when I was in my late teens, I started collecting the old time radio, and uh, it, that's a long story. In fact, boy, I must be one of Laura's oldest customers. I, I think I met her in 1984 when she was a school kid putting together the first paper issues of the Jack Benny Times. 
And uh, I still have them all downstairs, all the old ones. But uh, it, it was uh, the connection that uh, there were so many of these voices that I heard in, in old theatrical cartoons on episodes of The Jack Benny Show. Not just Mel Blanc, about 20 other people who did uh, animation work regularly. And that all tied into my kind of historical mind, which uh, loves to get connections, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I, I suddenly realized that in the late 30s and early 40s, all of these people on the West Coast were running from cartoon uh, recordings to back to doing uh, radio programs uh, as stooges, as comic stooges. And, uh, of course, Mel Blanc and Frank Nelson eventually became the highest um, exponents of that art form, um, simply through their sheer talents. And uh, and so um, it became a lifelong study and and really from about the mid eighties, I started taking it much more seriously than other people who'd say, Oh yeah, I've seen that guy, Mel Blank. You know, I wanted to know who that's how we discovered Jack Lescooley, who ended up doing the Jack Benny imitation in old late thirties cartoons, which was great because he did that same type of Jack that uh, Jack was in those days, which was that um, slightly petulant Jack (laughs) Benny G Nobody talks to me like that. You know, that sort of uh, snippy sort of thing that he eventually matured and became the much r- more rounded character. Uh, um, and so eventually it ended up not only writing to these people, which made it easy in one sense, because I had become a voice person in the business here in Australia for several years and and had met um, Doss Butler and Mel Blank and all of these people. And it gives you that sort of, they, the, if they know you're in the industry and you're making a living, suddenly you're just on their level. It's like there's no, you don't even have to bow and scrape, and which I, of course, I, I wanted to because they were heroes of mine. They were childhood idols. And to get to know five childhood idols in my lifetime and to get to know them very well, um, was, I, I look back now in my in my um, late 60s and, and think I was luckier than I even realized, you know especially now that they're all gone and and the memories of of being in their company and hearing things that um, weren't even in the books, you know, uh, different anecdotes that that, uh, nobody else has heard, you know, just that sort of thing. It made me want to really pay tribute to them in the most serious way. So I not only started collecting frantically all the radio shows that I researched that they were on and making detailed notes, Eventually, I ended up doing what Laura did, and which I had intended to do was to go to UCLA and go through all of the Jack Benny scripts. And thank God that I was that she published 39 Forever Volumes 1 and 2, the radio years. Um, at the time, I, I was busy doing other things because it saved me the work of doing what she did so brilliantly in those books. And I've meant to, yes, these are the these are the two invaluable books that I've meant to um thank her for in person for years and years. I, I, they truly are one of the great examples of radio scholarship. Um, the the amount of extra work and and uh, all the little indices that she created. And, uh, it, you know, I'm still, still learning things. Uh, the other day I, I discovered so many of the myth busters, you know, there are so many myths that they were talking about in, in with Neil and um, little things like, uh, and it's nothing to take away from Mel Blanc. That's that's just in terms of the timing of when he he really became prominent on the show by the uh, late forties, uh, where he was pretty much on from nineteen forty four every week. Uh, there'd be occasions where he he wouldn't, but uh, it was pretty much a given that it would be a Mel Blanc performance or or an appearance. And uh, you know, little things like him doing Polly the parrot or or the Maxwell. Um, you know, thanks to uh, the scripts that Laura researched, you know, we find that Pinto Colvig, the voice of Goofy, who was 10 years older than Mel Blanc, was already doing the Maxwell in 1938. Um, and Jack Benny being probably of all of the top radio star comedians, I believe had uh, the most intelligence and, and the most comedic uh, intelligence um, in the fact that Everyone from writers to to, uh, actors to um, even Mel Blanc himself, all of them spoke about Jack Benny's gifts for editing. And so he, I guess, had a mind like a comic steel trap where he would remember skits that worked 10 years ago and that would be brought back by the new team of writers, you know, um, uh, Perrin and Joseph Spurgeon and that crowd. 
um, and redone and made even better in the lucky strike years, made even more round and firm and fully packed, if you want. So free and easy on the draw? <laughs> yeah. So round, so firm, so fully packed, Jack. Whoa. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, I, it's amazing that you look up little um, things that uh, we think uh, are associated with Mel, like train leaving. Crane leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga <laughs> was was actually done by Bill Morrow back in like 1940, uh, when Mel was only used very sparingly as as one of many Stooges back then. Um, the first, uh, you know, uh, 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 Christmas shopping shows were done in New York in in the late 30s, where other Stooges played the uh, the same. Clerks who got uh, angry at Jack uh, back back then. Yeah, you uh, get like Morrow and Beloin actually even playing mm. some of those clerks too before you even get yes. Nelson and oh, Beloin yeah. together. Yeah. Yes, and 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 Eddie Beloin uh, was not only a great comedy writer; he had a gift for uh, comic acting. Mm. Uh, he would he would get the 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 kind of belly laughs from an audience at, a, at, a, at a, doing a tiny little bit line that Mel got years later. You know. Oh, so Mr. I think, I think Mr. Um, Mr. Go, go Billingsley has, Mr. Billingsley. Yes. Has, for, for, what a anybody, great character. for anybody who's still getting into Jack here at the convention yeah. and might be new to Jack, go to the 40s episodes and yes. look in for Mr. Billingsley, Jack's border. That is oh, yeah. insane. I love it. They, so they are. That's that's the probably the greatest example of non sequitur humor uh, to come out of somebody's mouth. Um, stuff that you go, what, wait a minute, what did I just hear? It was like an optical illusion of, of, of dialogue, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, <clears throat> so, so I believe that Jack Benny <clears throat> not only was very confident in his own skin because of his high intelligence, <clears throat> but I do believe that uh, he, he um, was also so confident in himself as a comedian that unlike other star comedians who, who often have the reputation of being... Um, uh, very standoffish. He um, was not threatened one bit by anyone else who got huge, huge laughs on the show. He knew it was for the sake of the show. He knew the show was everything. And uh, he was so confident in his own skin that uh, he allowed, oh, I would say even beyond Mel Blank, sometimes Frank Nelson, you know, when he finally developed that thing over about three years to become the, you, it's so nice to see you, Mr. Benny. You know, that character became, I would say, one of the most potent scene stealers in showbiz history. Drear Poussin. Drear Poussin. Yep. And that's, oh. one, of those, that's yeah. one of those times where Nelson himself said, like, I can't change the line. Jack doesn't like it when you change the line. And the writers right. would go, like, we'll take the heat. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <laughs> I have a question then in the grand scheme, because mm. we're going to we're, we're we're mainly here to talk about Mel. But as an extension right. based off of the conversation we had a few months back, sure, I yeah. wanted to also touch base on some of the other uh, voice actors who would end up finding their way into the Looney oh, Tunes yes. Lovely, um, yeah. uh, uh, or, or the other short subjects. Um, mm. But can you recall and I think we all know the answer, but just just for the sake of posterity, can you recall the first thing you remember watching Mel in? Um, and can you remember the first moment he made you laugh? Oh, oh without a doubt. Yes. Uh, I, I guess I was only around about 10 when I started watching uh, all of the old cartoons that had been sold to television, you know, in, in both all the English language countries. Um, I'm talking about the old theatrical cartoons. But because it was around 1960, and I guess I was like, I was six or seven, the end credits of the Bugs Bunny show, which was a brand new show that year, and I think I think Australia was the first foreign sale they had, and um, and at the end, one uh, credit um, page came up saying voice characterizations Mel Blank, which I didn't even know back then because they edited the original openings out of the cartoons on that series. But um, my parents suddenly said to me when I asked, "See, I'm only seven years old," asking my my mother about, "Have you ever heard of this guy Mel Blank?" Now that's that's a bit odd, isn't it? You know, for a mm -hmm. seven year old to be that interested, and. Um, and she um, then showed me that uh, two nights later was the Jack Benny TV show coming on television. And by it, it's almost like fate was smiling on me because <clears throat> they reran the old 1956 episode where Mel comes strolling on the stage as uh, uh, the talent contestant and mm -hmm. um, does the English horse and the uh, um, uh, and 
and and it's that that um oh is it stanley grop or something like that and he kept he kept accidentally spitting on jack <laughs> <laughs> sorry i get you wet there jack <laughs> and he was doing all these other he did dogs and he did all the voices he did in cartoons and then he i think he um he ended up doing Porky Pig. So suddenly it was like this this explosion went off in my head saying, you mean there are people who make a living doing all these zany voices? And, and it was like I was meant to carry on the, the torch. That's what they told me years later, strangely enough. But uh, they were the two within a week of, of seeing Mel Blanc. And, and uh, you know, just just interrupting your, your, your question there, one of the, the great frustrations in researching as deeply as people like Laura and myself are doing is suddenly you find something that is like a a holy grail moment that has disappeared and can't be seen and that is her book revealed that years before even a year before he even got to Warner Brothers doing cartoon voices Mel Blanc was on a 1936 episode of Benny um mm-hmm. and it's only half a disc and it's um June the 7th, 1936, the one with Leo Robin and Ralph Ranger, the guys who wrote Love and Bloom yep. as the guests. And he plays a studio exec called Gensler uh, from, from Paramount. And that section of the show is missing. And it's like, mm-hmm. uh, it's like fate is saying one day it might turn up, but you're not allowed <laughs> to hear it right now. <laughs> and it was like historical because it was three years before he even did Carmichael. And then, mm. then he only had that one one year, thirty nine forty, where he was on the show. And then he was in, um, as his memory played up, you know, he he thought he went straight into being a regular weekly guest. Really, that didn't happen for him until the beginning of the forty three forty four season. And mm-hmm. and it was a slightly slightly gradual build, like like that Herman Peabody nebbish little character, uh, Gee, Mister Penny, you know. Uh, <laughs> I remember you you told me once that um, Herman Peabody was the first one you ever heard. Yes, um, right, right. Because so the comedy superstar set that my dad got me that led to this, uh, to me sitting in a convention like this, is um, <laughs> it's all his fault. Um, <laughs> and he might be participating right now in the audience. So, hello, dad. Um, but uh, he, uh, the one that he got me had uh, the grape nut, the end of the grape nuts years and the beginning of the lucky strike years, right? And that yeah. was the period where it was. Like what I think one of the big threads in it is uh, "Horn Blows at Midnight" mm-hmm. uh, being made, and Alexis Smith being on tour uh, for a, for two episodes. But yeah, yeah, Herman Peabody is the first time that I heard him on Jack's show. Now, obviously, yes. Looney Tunes had happened before. We, I'm part of the last bastion of generation that probably saw the Looney Tunes on television thanks to Cartoon mm-hmm. Network. Um, and um, and I didn't put Herman Peabody to Mel Blanc right away, but then right. as I kept listening. I was like, that voice sounds familiar. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's well, like and, and it was also it. kind of a it was a kind of a straight character. It wasn't a zany voice. Um, it was just this kind, just kind of a, a sort of a nebbish little character, you know, like uh, uh, a, a, like a timid little character. Yeah, it's it's uh. like it's kind of like a it, it's it's almost feels like if you stuck that in a Coen Brothers movie, it might somehow work. Like this, <laughs> <laughs> this, little, this little like just very like. Okay, yeah. yes, I guess I'll steal the yeah. money. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He had that kind of real croaky. So yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. The one right. that I remember the most though is and in that bit is that he was trying to sell him like I think it was like asteroid insurance yes. or something. Yeah. Being and then hit he, by the planet Mars or something. <laughs> yeah, being hit by the planet Mars, exactly. And then yeah. at the end of the bit, he goes, Oh, by the way, Mr. Benny, here's your telescope, or what here's your gift. And he goes, What is this? A telescope. If you see it coming, get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the way he goes away yeah. that I still yeah. like, I'll put that episode up and I'll just giggle at oh, yeah. I'll like repeat that little bit. Um yeah. and well, um, he- that 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 was really the first regular thing he did, and they, I guess that character lasted for like a few, quite a few eps in that season. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was also he did Herman Peabody on I think a, a lesser show like Jack Carson's show or something like. So sometimes there's those little connections too, um, yeah. because some of those like the Tommy Riggs show were also written by George Balzer and, uh, um, but um, you know when he was Carmichael that that one I I know um, came because he was starting to be discussed in cartoons by then doing crazy little things and i guess industry scuttle but because it was still 1939 it was five more years before he ever got a screen credit 
Mm -hmm. Um, So he was still an anonymous person, but, but being in the industry, they would have said, who was the guy who did that? He's been in a couple of these Schlesinger cartoons, you know, Leon Schlesinger. And they would have said, Oh, it's this guy, Mel Blank. You've had him on the show a few years back. And uh, so he comes in doing this this bear because it was an animated type character on radio, you know, a, a talking. And and even just his his um, first appearance where Rochester's trying to give him medicine for his cold, he gets a laugh from the audience, and he's this, this anonymous young stooge coming in because suddenly Carmichael, um, you know, he does that. But suddenly, when he's trying, come on, come on, take it, take it, he, you can hear suddenly he goes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because Carmichael had a toothache. It's a That's big, right. Yeah. It's a big laugh, you know. And I think, I think even then, Benny thought, "Hmm, I'm hanging on to him. He's got a comic sense." And you can hear him interacting with it in that first, mm-hmm. in that first Carmichael yeah. appearance to, to a T, because it's a. It, it, there's a great line where you hear Mel still continuing to do it, and you hear yes. a, a peak in Jack's voice when they're going like, "Shall I call the doctor?" He goes, "Doctor, doctor, nothing. Get Frank Buck." <laughs> <laughs> you just hear Mel uh, continuing wonderful. like Bleh. yes uh, it's yeah. um now this is uh the so we kind of answered those two like like peak peak ones there and the debut and we've got like a, a slew of characters that Mel performed mm-hmm. in perpetuity over right. the years as Benny and uh, the mm-hmm. lovely folks John and Larry Gassman and Walden are you guys there Yes, I am. Wonderful. Guys, how are you? Hey, how you yeah. doing, Keith? <laughs> real good, real good, uh, good. John and Larry. Thank yeah, you. wonderful. So uh, these the lovely the lovely Gasmans of the YUSA network have uh, uh, been so kind as to pull up some clips for us uh, to kind of uh, play so that we can discuss uh, some of these characters here. So, Terrific. Larry, would you mind pulling up Professor LeBlanc for us? One of my favorites. Where, where is he? Where is he, Larry? Larry. <laughs> no, 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 Michel Benny. Please, <laughs> turn up the violin. I will make the A on no. the piano. <laughs> No, 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 you are flat. Pull the string up a little tighter. Okay. <laughs> tighter. Tighter. Ah! <laughs> oh, darn it, the string broke. Good, that's <laughs> one down and three to go. <laughs> Here's your violin. We will start with the piece I gave you last time. Uh, uh, what was it again? The, uh, the glow worm. Uh, oui, monsieur, the glow worm. Uh, it is very pretty. It uh, commence. Okay. <laughs> Monsieur Benny. <laughs> Monsieur Benny. <laughs> it is such a small worm. Do not kill it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll take it again. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Benet, huh? what are the plink plinks? Uh, I'm stepping over the worm. <laughs> Mr. Benet, leave the jokes to the comedians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Perhaps we better limber up a little more with the exercises. Uh, as you wish. <laughs> Play it softer with emotion. Dip your bow in Jurgen's lotion. <laughs> Nero played while Rome was burning. Right now for a match I'm yearning. <laughs> no, Mr. Benet, uh, you are sounding worse than ever. But, Professor, I've been practicing two hours every day. How can you stand it? <laughs> What? Uh, Look, that is enough of the exercises. Let us go back to the lesson. This time, get the tempo right. We will use the metronome. Okay. Tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> Mr. Benny, what is that? Eastern Columbia, Broadway at night. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Oh, I love it. And uh, what is that? Uh, Follies Burlesque, Main Street at 6. <laughs> oh, oui, oui. The third girl from the end with the red hair. Oh, la, la. Professor. <laughs> Professor LeBlanc. Excuse me. I, I hope you will not say anything to my wife. Your wife? Why? She is the third girl from the other end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's the one with the... Oh, your wife! <laughs> Well, anyway, so let's get on with the lesson. I want to go out and play football. Oui, oui. Commence. Okay. You know, that was, that was actually, by sheer coincidence, that was the first radio show I ever heard, December 7, 47, when he wants to go and play football with the kids. Wonderful! So yeah. we get to we got to hear yeah. your first Jack Benny member of Jack yeah. Benny radio first show one too. I got on a on a cassette from a, some old time radio seller back in the in the seventies, and uh, it was that episode, and and that is where I started practicing Professor uh, LeBlanc. Uh, uh, what what the host Zach is for Benny, but he only gets one penny. <laughs> <laughs> but I, no. you know, and and that running gag, and and then I learned. Um, in fact, uh, Mel Blank talked about this on one of the more serious interviews he did with a guy called Tom Reed. Um, very, very interesting interview. And and uh, he said that as a child, he studied for eight years. He studied violin. That's why he was so proficient um, at music and at singing and all of that, because he was such a, a born musician, Mel Blank. And um, and that famous TV episode where he grabbed Jack's violin off him and and um, and suddenly played violin just as well, if not, if not better. And uh, and uh, these 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 guys back then developed so many talents and so many skills. And these days, you know, people might have one particular thing they can do so well. And and it was a given back then that you just wanted to be more versatile than the next person, you know. And that's how you got work. I feel like yeah, that's like. But I, I always go to the to the prime motivation of most of those actors that we put on these legendary pedestals is they really right. wanted eat to eat. They really oh, wanted yeah. food. <laughs> you know, like they were, they were all depression, and and a lot of them were depression bred too. So they had that insecurity their whole lives. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if they if if people did act a bit jerky uh, in in showbiz uh, and had feet of clay, it was often because they were. They, they, for years, they'd been thinking this might all disappear tomorrow, you know, as, mm -hmm. as successful as they were. And, and, uh, it, that really was a, a common thread amongst a lot of the lower rung, you know. Yeah, agreed. And I'm, it's funny because we were, as we were stopping on that clip, um, it's funny because he mentions Professor LeBlanc mentions his wife. It's kind of amazing right. that this character, as the Benny show goes, um, along and, and the Benny shows can be compared to Seinfeld in the respect that, like, um, you know, like you can, it, it develops these through lines that if you're loyal, they, mm. they, they pay off. They and reward. Yeah, exactly. And professor LeBlanc develops as a character to the point where you have the, um, the IRS coming to visit professor <laughs> LeBlanc to talk about Jack. Uh, yeah. you have the Coleman's, uh, interact with him at a given point. Um, and they, uh, one of my favorite ones is that Jack goes to, uh, Professor LeBlanc's house for a visit and <laughs> he starts playing the violin and it's making their child cry and you keep hearing <laughs> the, uh, LeBlanc going, please, Mr. Benny, the baby, she's crying. <laughs> it's like, you, we always talk about like how Jack uh, is like, he's the character that uh, contributes, uh, that uh, shows all our faults and frailties and it's like, yes, it's you yeah. can it has the element of cringe and that's yeah. one of those instances of just like, Jack is deplorable here. <laughs> <laughs> But also the, the whole thing with the stinginess, which I think was his absolute most regular uh, and, and um, looked forward to uh, flaw in his character. And um, you, you, see, you mentioned one of those great IRS episodes. I, I, just little throwaway things that, that hooked me on the show when I was much younger were, were the, the sheer gall of the comedy, you know, where uh, he'd be, <clears throat> I don't care. I've got nothing to hide. And suddenly you hear the doorbell <laughs> Income, I, I mean, come in. <laughs> Suddenly, really scared. <laughs> there's a, actually there's a question there, like that might be off to the side for a second, because like I'm trying to remember in the book, 
Um, I, I don't know if I saw the name there, but Joseph Kearns is one of the guys who right. um, yeah. uh, is one of the IRS guys. I, he didn't do any animation, did he? That I'm aware of. He like, did. He did. Uh, he. I wish he had. I mean, he did the the doorknob in in Disney's Alice in Wonderland, and and in the book, I do say he should have done many more cartoons because he was right. In, in fact, one of the great voice actors, Doris Butler, who is a contemporary of Mel. Um, his favorite actors because he was younger were joe kearns and an english actor called ben wright and um and joe kearns could suddenly match mel's broadness he was such a great dramatic actor on suspense he was on almost every week for like like you know 15 years and suddenly he's on the mel blank show playing mr colby and he's matching mel blank's crazy broadness and and doing things that i never thought i'd hear a dramatic actor like joe kearns ever do and again he was one of jack benny's favorites as a supporting supporting actor especially the underplaying of of ed you know oh yeah uh, oh, sick, sickness in, sickness in the family mr benny you know that <laughs> that, that very underplayed type of benny humor compared what? to the zany stuff i like how when he when ed uh, asks for a camera for christmas and he goes the click breaks the monotony <laughs> 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 oh look they were they were all so great uh it's just the uh, joe kearns did do a lot of voices in some uh mgm animation things that were more industrial cartoons you know like mm -hmm. uh, fun, fun and facts about america they were corporate cartoons he and frank nelson and herb vigran were 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 in almost all of them and you could should, should seek them out because the actual voice work is terrific and very cartoony and very much like a benny show it, it's one of those like, he he's one of those actors that like when i i heard him i'm uh the first time i heard him outside of jack probably would have been armist brooks mm -hmm. he pops up in there every so often it's just yeah. it's he yeah. like elliot lewis is one of those guys that just like i like hearing their versatility like yeah we have some yeah. of the one of the folks in the chat is talking about like suspense and how like he's one of those reasons that suspense is a top 10 show it's miss emmy right yeah. that that is great to point out about like how all of these actors, Mel and everybody else, like would were versatile around the clock. So mm. like Mel was also the postman on Burns and Allen. Yeah. Um, yeah. and he um he contributed a lot to not just animation, but like you can like see the you can see his evolution as a performer, then like, it just like developed to where he becomes like method in his uh yeah. in his characters, even though he yeah. never saw it as method as Noel pointed out. Mm -hmm. Um like he was just like it's a you just do the job <laughs> yeah that's right yeah um but um another routine that we want to touch up on here is i think it's it's one that um is 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 so simple because it's so few words and right. yet it carries so much uh weight um can you go ahead and pull up for a csi routine uh mr gasman Wandering for days, I stumbled exhausted into a camp of insurrectos. At first, they were suspicious, but finally, one of them came over and shook my hand. You want to shake hands? Si. <laughs> then I consider you my friend? Si. You will always help me? Si. Then, to my surprise, he walked away. Turn to go. Someone pulled at my sleeve. Oh, Senor Iris, Senor Iris. What is it? Uh, before you leave, I would like you to meet my little six-year-old son, Tomas. Oh, hello, Tomas. Uh, Tomas, he is learning to be a magician. He does a wonderful act on the stage with his sister. Really? So you're a magician, eh, Tomas? Say. <laughs> Do you have an act? Say. With your sister? Say. What is your sister's name? So. <laughs> Sue? Sí. What do you do in your act? Saw. What do you saw? Sue. <laughs> Sue? you up to this? Who was it? Me. <laughs> you? Si. Who are you? Sign. <laughs> Sign? Si. Now, oh, 
Oh my and god! He finally got Mel to break up instead of the other way around. So that that is uh, that is an example of 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 a of a comedy routine. You know, like everybody talks about like Habit and Costello and who's on first, and it's like one of the right. great burlesque turned radio routines with its wordplay. This is sure. wordplay condensed. Like oh, it, it shows it's the power haiku. of economy. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. Haiku, I love that. Yeah. And and it, I believe it was Balzer. Uh, it was his baby, um, not not the other three in in uh, that team. Uh, I believe he he kind of was pretty proud of that as being his one. It, it's it's something that like it's similar to the English horse bit where it would crack mm. Jack up. Like you got yeah. you got him out of there. The the television special, the twentieth anniversary television special, which has them at the airport. Um, right. meeting all of his famous characters. You even hear the train announcer in that one. And right. um, uh, I remember, like, this is one of the reasons why I'll always love this bit is we, I was on a set and I was stressing out, like I was having anxiety attacks about, and it was an old time radio themed film. And mm -hmm. I, uh, my AD came up to me. He knew I loved Jack Benny and he pulled out his phone. He pulled up YouTube and he says like, here, I need you to calm down. <laughs> he, <laughs> he pulled up the seaside routine from YouTube. Oh, and I just immediately relaxed and what's great yeah. is how he he adapted it into other like the treasure of the sierra madre episode is mm -hmm. like the, the the firm builder but he always found a way to right. do it in other forms too um i would i think, believe it's mutiny on the bounty um, right uh, or captain horatio hornblower i'm sorry they do that version in french with a yeah. french general we 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 see <laughs> but uh and, oh yeah and it's like it's it's not like leblanc where it evolved or anything per se it's just more that like they found ways to use it mm. in a way you weren't expecting yeah um and it shows and I, that I, I, it, it, it was so clever i think even even the public who are non-professionals picked up on its cleverness on a subconscious level and years later you know that famous clip of of mel in the sombrero uh, and and jack runs into him on camera in in the tv years and the minute Mel's face is suddenly, he looks up from his siesta and looks up at Jack, uh, and you can hear it. The whole live studio audience go, "Oh!" as if to say, "It's that guy. He's going to do that bit," you know. And, and and it's like they predict it. It's it's amazing to see that that TV clip uh, and hear that studio audience because then it leads straight into, "Are you waiting for a train?" See, you know. And <laughs> and then of course it's just it's like the old radio skit. That's all they needed, uh, apart from the fact that a camera was on them. It was just the radio skit. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Indeed. And um, we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier the train announcer. Mm. I want to move into him now because that right. one has immediate connection to the animation world in a few oh, yeah. places. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Gaspin, can you give us some of the, the, I need to know where I'm going on this train. Where am I going? I'm here at the train station. Where am I going? <laughs> See, the station is crowded. Rochester. Yes, boss. Put on your red cap and carry my bags to the train. Will you? <laughs> I got to meet my gang. Yeah. Train leaving on track five for Ranaheim, us for Ranaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Gee, we're all supposed to meet here at the information desk. Hey, Phil, Don. Oh, hello, Jack. Hiya, Jackson. Say, fellas, Mary went right to the train. She's got a cold. Oh, that's too bad. Carry in there under your arm. Well, I heard it was pretty cold in New York, and I want to be on the safe side. But Jackson, a smudge pot. pot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not taking any chances. You train know. leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Does anybody want to go to Anaheim or Zuzar or Cucamonga? Say, Don, have you got all the tickets? Well, not quite, Jack. At the last minute, Phil said he needed an extra one. Phil, who are you sneaking on this trip with you? Well, it's Frankie, my guitar player. I got to take him along on account of the magazines. The magazines? Yeah, he reads to me. <laughs> Now, let's see. The ticket window ought to be... Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Medusa, and Cucamonga. Oh, come on. Somebody must want to go to Anaheim, Medusa, and Cucamonga. <laughs> 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 
Now, let's see. The ticket window should be... Train right. leaving. See, the ticket window should train be... Train right. leaving on track five for Anaheim, Azusa, and Coop. Look, we're not asking much. Two of you, or even one of you. Just somebody to keep the engineer company. <laughs> Here's the ticket window. I'm sorry, but our trains are all booked up. Well, think, man, think. There must be one train that has room. Being on track for Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Look, look, there are 5,000 people in this station. Isn't there somebody, anybody, under any volunteer? Clerk, I've waited here long enough. You've just got Well, to... well, you're in luck, Blue Eyes. <laughs> I found one ticket on the Chief. Good, I'll take it. The Chief, leaving for New York. All aboard! All aboard! Hurry up, hurry up, will you, Clerk? Thanks, thanks. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. I'm coming, I'm coming! <laughs> Train leaving on track five. <laughs> and I'm I'm coming, fellas, I'm coming. Wait for me. Wait for me. Wait for me. Hey, Jackson, we're moving. Hurry up. I'm coming. I'm coming. Wait for me. Well, Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, here is my good friend, F.E. Boone. Sorry Great. about the that's, audio buffering there. That wasn't that's much all right. Audio. That's oh, okay. No, yeah, it's all good. Wonderful. Um, I was revisiting all this stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's great. You kind of you, we're we're getting a little bit of a of the Jack Benny show experience, yeah. so we don't have to oh, just yeah. listen to it at home. Um, and uh, that one is a great one because of how it builds. Um, yeah. Do do you have a favorite instance, Keith, of the train announcer? Oh, that that very one because I believe that was from that very historical show where from January 45 where suddenly they came up with like three long running bits in the same show the train the vault and uh, there was I'm sure there was one other thing plus it was really the formulation of of the final version of Frank Nelson's uh, sarcastic uh, guy that just grew in craziness mm -hmm. over the next few years um so that one and I remember actually listening to an interview with Mel done by Dan Pasternak when he was just a kid and um Mel just suddenly threw in something that blew me away uh, uh, about knowledge that I had no idea. He explained Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga as if he was telling a young kid what it really was about. He said, of course, those towns weren't connected. And then he said, and Azusa um, got its name in real life. It got its name because it was like a, the A to Z of the USA. And I had no idea about that, you know. And, of course, I knew Anaheim because of Disneyland uh, as an Australian, you know, that's like a, a famous thing about California. But uh, Cucamonga, of course, had such a great rhythm for a comedy routine. And then, of course, it was only natural that the writers would, you know, take that and suddenly come up with the idea of the coup and then the long suspense pause before he, he finishes it, you know. Uh, but I, 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 I love that that January 45 show for being so historical and, and, and introducing in one fell swoop three bits that became running gags for the next 10 years before the radio show ended. I'm 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 partial to that um, to one that extended off of that ability to carry off of that historic show. Um, it's one that they play. I think balls are actually played it a couple of times when uh, showing examples of the of how the routine worked. But one mm. of them is that uh, Mel. It's not the Cucamonga bit, but it is the announcer because they found different ways to use him. And one of them was that they had him going like train leaving on track two for Asheville, Nashville. Oh, yeah. Takes on yeah. water at Waterloo. And then Sammy <laughs> Wise starts going in on the drums. <laughs> they, <laughs> and, and then they keep going with it. Um, and at one point, Mary goes, Jack, um, where's your, where's where's the where's the where's our train department? And he goes, I don't know. It's not on the hip parade yet. Um, <laughs> and then at the end of that bit, um, he does the rhyming. There's a right. pause. 
And Mary, he goes, Mary, I'm going to go get a magazine. And then you hear the drum. And he does this <laughs> bit as the train announcer where he just goes, watch it, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> watch it, Sam. <laughs> and, um, and the other one that's a good one to for people to look up is when in the middle of it, you suddenly hear a female train announcer, which I, I'm not sure if it's Bia, uh, B. Benedict or Sarah. Um, but um, they, they yeah. she does the cucamonga bit and she goes, my husband is out to lunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then at the end of it, she starts doing part of it. And then you hear Mel going, well, I'm back from lunch, honey. <laughs> Azusa and cucamonga. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, lovely stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, that really. And and then, of course, he, he um, I think he ended up doing doing that on in later in life when he became a like an interview person mel blank mm -hmm. you know <clears throat> and even for young audiences who'd never grown up with radio he might be on the 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 carson show or something like that and and uh he'd do a tiny bit of professor leblanc and then he'd suddenly train leaving on track five for anaheim azusa and 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 audiences young young audiences would laugh because it was a, like a funny cartoon voice they'd heard in their head you know and uh, I think it, it, it was like remarkable uh, that that Mel Blank was suddenly had that lease on life again in his um, late seventies when he did those Amex commercials on camera, and a whole international uh, world suddenly knew who the voice of Bugs Bunny was in his old age. You know, he became a celebrity again. That's why he came to Australia, and I met him at that radio interview. So that brings up a question here that's actually in the Q&A thread. We'll, we'll divert for a quick second because it kind of extends off of that. Well, sure. Rodri Rodrigo asked, did movie audiences in the 40s recognize some of the voices or on, on cartoons to be the same ones they heard at home on radio? Um, like, I, I, I only have a little bit of evidence that they did, and there was nothing remarkable about it then. It's kind of like hearing a celebrity today on The Simpsons. Um, I think um, people in those days, because radio, there was there was no TV, so every home had the radio. And by then, in the 40s, the, the comedy shows were really well known nationally. I think uh, at, at the theatre, when they would see a cartoon with uh, Screwy Squirrel, who was the actor Wally Mayer or Mel Blanc doing something, they they just look at each other and nudge and say that was that guy on the well you know the most famous example was um, in the Bugs Bunny cartoon about Easter the Easter rabbit and and he he had the voice of the Happy Postman because I'm sure some of the um, cartoon scribes suddenly said to Mel one day you know that Happy Postman character has been going for so long we should put him in a cartoon so it was, oh and remember keep smiling you know and 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 it was a funny like all of his voices that were not animated voices were funny cartoon voices anyway on on radio it's 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 interesting to me that these voices have transcended through these two mediums yeah. right right that, 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 that's that seems like i i mean i'm sure there are modern day comparisons that i might not be thinking about at the moment and we can always discuss it in the after show too and can and get a collective consensus from the modern standpoint but mm -hmm. to, to to think of the cross promotion like but bill in the chat was just mentioning like didn't didn't he play bugs on on jack's program a couple times oh yeah yeah he did and i also remember a bit where they were trying to uh get a, get a gopher out of a trap or get a gopher right. into the trap and you hear it kind of going for the and uh yeah. um and uh jack goes if he should if he says what's up doc i'll shoot him with my gun <laughs> um, now yeah, um there had been a couple i think there was a dream sequence once and uh and and me bugs bunny was in the dream and and i can't remember what what episode it was but um uh, by then, of course, that was when, you know, he, he was doing his famous running gag about uh, he was doing that Molly voice. Oh, Mr. Bunny, have you got any parts for me this week? You know, and that, that was the same season as the Jolson. One of a, one of yeah. what a great segue into that, because we've got two more characters before we have a second to talk about some of the other voice actors. But I, I can right. already tell you, Keith, I want for you for a part two uh, in some form <laughs> or fashion. Maybe we can do it as a Benny, uh, a sure. Benny one month yeah. event. But Anytime. the, um, uh, you just mentioned the Jolson bit. I think this might be, apart from the department store clerk, my favorite Ben uh, Mel Blanc character is himself. Yeah. yeah. Well, they begging, related. Yeah. Yeah. Beg begging for a job. Um, right. Do you, do, again, Mr. Gasman, do you happen to have uh, Al, uh, Al Jolson as done by Mr. Mel Blanc? I'm not finding it here. Ah. Uh, well, 
it, it well, was it. Oh. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah it was, it was, that was it was the running gag of that every week. You know, yes, this um the the a uh, good go to for people if they want to hear this bit immediately is the uh two uh the two parter episode especially especially where. Jack is doing inventory in his pantry and he gets hit by a can and suddenly becomes mm-hmm. generous. And right. suddenly he gives Mel Blanc a job. But throughout the whole season, you have Mel Blanc uh, begging Jack for a job. And at one point he's like, but I can do imitations. Mm-hmm. I can do anything. And then it builds and builds until he gets to Al Jolson and he just goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 uh, and as a matter of fact, it started at the beginning of the 4950 season uh, mm-hmm. on the second the second episode of that season and um uh, it, it's like this gag where he's done this character this mooly thing m o o l e y which was a, a a kind of an old vaudeville expression for a kind of a dumb guy not very bright and benny rubin used to do it and uh and then mel blank kind of took it over and uh it was just one of these guys he had he said he had mooly voices from one to five and he said each one had he said number number one's just kind of a guy like this he just sort of uh you know kind of a slightly slow he said by the time you get to mooly voice number five oh, well gee must the paint oh, i'm not sure exactly <laughs> oh, you know and so he, it was like levels of of mental impairment but uh <laughs> but um he um he did this thing and it was Mel Blank as Mel Blank. And it was just so funny that he chose that character to be him. You know, it was like, oh, Mr. Bunny, I was just wondering if you had any parts for me because I can do all these imitations, you know, like Humphrey Bogart and I can do Charles Boyer and, and Al Jolson. <laughs> <laughs> Which was like a send up of all the people who ever imitated Jolson down on his knee going, oh, mama, oh. <laughs> And, the, and, the passion, and, the passion. <laughs> and I believe that season, part of that season culminates that gag with Jolson himself being on the it's, show because this is around in, the, the Jolson story later, time. Yeah. yeah. About yeah. A- April 2, 1950, he appeared, I think. And uh, and um, you're, you haven't got that Mel Blanc around here, have you, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, you know, uh, it was so successful, that that, that bit of just... Mah! It got <laughs> such a big laugh um, that after six weeks... Um, Mel Blank's management, um, they'd arranged a recording session at Capitol Records um, in November 7, 1949. He'd only done it for six weeks on The Benny Show, and he recorded Toot, Toot, Tootsie Goodbye in the Jolson voice. Uh, touchy, good my. It was really actually a much more accurate Jolson. And then they were in the instrumental break, like the band were playing like Spike Jones, and uh, and and every time it went doodle-doop, <laughs> like there'd be tiny little one second no music and that's when he threw in his <laughs> so that that he he got a little hit comedy record for adults not in the kids line from capitals kids line but from the adult line um just from six weeks on the benny show that's the that's the exposure radio used to have in those days it was like tv these days or, or the youtube phenomenon you know um, Is it, that's actually uh, that was a point you brought up in your book about how many times you hear "Want to Buy a Duck" in a cartoon from the era, right. yeah. because they're 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 taking a uh, they were taking time with making these cartoons, so those yeah. those references are already being laid in even after the gag had died out on radio. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and and especially like like as we discussed before when uh, he did that celebrity cartoon and there was Ray Milland from. Um, Oh, the lost weekend, mm-hmm. and yeah. and the joke yeah. the joke almost died a little bit in the theaters because it, by by the time the cartoon was animated and, and completed, um, the lost weekend was like eighteen months earlier. So you know yeah. there was the, the unfortunate lag time in doing topical stuff with animation is the time it takes to physically produce a cartoon is usually about a year after the recording is done of the dialogue. Yeah, and that, yeah. but I do still like that gag. It it holds up oh, yeah. uh, solidly yeah. well because it's for anybody who doesn't know, Ray Milland gets a uh, right. gives them a typewriter in exchange for a, a drink, and then uh, the <laughs> the bartender goes, "You changed there," and then yeah. he hands them like small <laughs> typewriters. Yeah, it's little tiny typewriters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great alcoholism joke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now, before we go, because we we might be running a little short, but um, yeah. before we do the last big uh, Mel character, let's talk a little bit about some of the other act performers that we have um, sure. in, in the show. Um, B. Benadera and Sarah Berner play major roles in your book, oh, especially yeah. Sarah yeah. Berner. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk about a little bit about what you appreciate about their performances on the show 
and like and and how like what what do you love out of them like it could be the op phone operators or anything else yeah. well the, the definitely the phone operators as a matter of fact that may have been one of the things in that that historic 19 january 45 show that was also brand new <clears throat> but um particularly the phone operators because that had another 10 years of life you know they J jack was so brilliant and judicious in the way he would rest something for a few months and then bring it back again and then it would become regular for a few weeks again and um sarah burner of course had been in cartoons i think uh five or six years before b benadaret even they were both contemporaries they were both in radio in the late 30s in fact b was on some of jack's 1938 shows that madame lazonga or whatever it was and mm -hmm. the, the, like a like a seer and uh sarah burner had um mostly been an impressionist in the in the late 30s doing her Catherine hepburn in cartoons and all of that but uh she my favorite thing she did on the benny show sarah burner was the uh the off-key singer mm -hmm. who um i i can't think of one of the songs but um it, it was i'm that... walking behind you <laughs> i'm walking behind you <laughs> and, and... melancholy baby Melancholy yes, baby, yes, yes, melancholy right. baby. Or she'd do that little little trill in baby. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and B Benadaret was just so good, uh, uh, such a good actress, and and apparently, um, in real life, was a very close friend of of Mel Mel and Estelle Blank, mm -hmm. and um, they they done so much radio. God, I think B. And Elvira Ullman was the other great female comic uh, performer. Were on the Burns and Allen show weekly as as members of Gracie's little club, and um, and of course you know she so therefore she would have been in the studio with Mel every week when he was doing his Happy Postman thing as well as cartoons, and so um, and then all the way up to 1960 when Mel debuted on TV and he got out of his Warner exclusive contract as Barney Rubble and she's Betty Rubble, you know. So there's there's a twenty year um, voice relationship there, um, but uh, yeah, just uh, just wonderful. Um, the, the, they were two very very versatile. They were female versions of Mel Blanc. Put it that way. Yeah, I um I I enjoyed the off key singer as well. I'm glad we share that mm. same sentiment because it's one of the I love how Jack interacts with the, the bit too because it's usually there must be something wrong with this radio. Right. Um, <laughs> like in, Trying yeah, to get there's something something wrong here. I watch it through. And 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 then I I also loved, I think I mentioned to you in our last uh, chat together on in the cartoon segment where um Mel and, and B were in one Warner Brothers cartoon in the background, uh, the radio. Uh, Sylvester turns the radio on. And yes. it's a soap opera. And you can hear um, oh Melvin, what are we going to do? I don't know, Beatrice. <laughs> and they say their own <laughs> names, you know. It's like just an in-joke, but uh, to us we get it, you know. <laughs> yeah, and we and and there's one more person we want to bring up here before we we close with the department store clerk. Um oh, yeah. is yeah. um John L. C. Savoni. Uh, yes. now there's oh. a voice. <laughs> there's a voice. Um, <laughs> do, do you, I, I took, he took a while for me to grow accustomed to him. How did you first react to John L.C. Savone on the well, show? Well, you see, being older than you, I already knew Frank Fontaine because um, when I was about 10 and getting into Jack Benny's TV shows, he was on the Jackie Gleason show every week playing that same voice, except by then it was called Crazy Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. Well, was that that same? Yeah, hi, Joe. Hi, Mr. <laughs> and 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 of course, it was based. He he'd already been famous um, doing this in on stage as John L. C. Silvoni, who was a sweet, a drunken sweepstakes winner. And apparently, I think he may have got that from an earlier uh, vaudeville, which is just kind of par for the course in those days. I think uh, bits that that the originator may have died, and it was it was up for grabs. And he had this character because the thing with Frank Fontaine is you'll also recognize that uh, some of the shows that he's in, he does impressions of movie stars where he was known as an as a mimic doing very accurate Cary Grant years later on the, on the Jackie Gleason show not only was he doing the Silvoni character on, from Benny as Crazy Guggenheim sometimes when he'd do that 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 gimmick each week where he'd he'd go from that crazy voice and he'd suddenly sing in his real baritone you know and it was always a bit of an eyebrow raiser because it was such a sweet baritone voice but sometimes he would just suddenly break into 
Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra voices singing the same song, you know, or, or, and then he, one episode, he even broke into showing, keeping up to date. He was doing Bobby Kennedy, believe it or not. <laughs> there is a, it's actually funny because we, I, in that same chat, we talked about Kent Rogers and the wonderful work, word work he does on Hollywood steps out. Oh yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Fontaine and Kent Rogers are the best dueling Cary Grants. If you want to put yes. them side oh, by yeah. side and yeah. see who's getting the pitch, right. Cause it's, right. it's a, it's a voice that shouldn't exist to begin with. Cary Grant con concocted it, but yeah, then, but, yeah. but, but then to have you, Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> you, yeah. I want to, you better close the convention out for us as Cary Grant. <laughs> yes. I'd certainly love to. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great awful truth um i can't do it um now i want to close it out with a discussion and then one last clip for us um it's probably the darkest character in the benny arsenal and it's the department store clerk <laughs> yes. the character who has gone from i think it's literally in one of his first appearances right. it may not be the first one but it's among the first by yeah. the very end on the radio show of that bit where Jack just puts it one more step out of the line of, of, of plastic tips and metal tips. You hear a gun, you hear a gunshot. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm a person who like takes that kind of, you know, I take that seriously, like with mental yeah. health and whatnot yes. from a dark comedy perspective, it is astounding that they got away with that then and on television, because it's like, it is a comedy program and you have like one of the darkest endings to a Christmas oh, yeah. special ever. Yeah. But it's also the way he melts down. Um, yes. It's this, yes. this the amount of meltdown that he has listening to him chippy in the beginning of the television episode. Yeah. And then he breaks down so much that you see Jack covering his mouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he always broke Jack up on that particular one. That one that one that was done on film is one of the great <laughs> examples of 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 um, the Jack Benny show on television. Um, there's a great Frank Nelson in that, and there's a great appearance by Mel, and and it really demonstrates his range too, because uh, and how clever an actor Mel was, because uh, like on a lot of the radio versions, which by then had been built up to, so that the audience knew this routine each each Christmas, mm -hmm. um, he starts off just in his uh, kind of his normal voice, like oh yeah sure Mr Benny yeah yeah I'd love to find this for you, and and, and by the end of the episode and, and by the end of that TV episode he does his Yosemite Sam voice, which which is is like the biggest lung buster of all, where where he Benny's come back about four times and on this this occasion it's like oh no now what <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, it, it's Yosemite Sam. <laughs> it's yeah. Oh, that's a oh my god! I didn't even put that together before. He does have a kind of a Yosemite Sam like in that when he when he yells like that. Yeah, and yeah. the zoom knocked it down. We didn't hear you yell. The zoom <laughs> pressure knocked it down completely. I know. Wow. I, yeah. Oh well, it was like no nah, what no nah, what like that you know, but but shrieked. Yeah. yeah, I keep I keep forgetting that Zoom does that. Yeah. Yeah, but it's um it's also that it's also had alternative bits to it because they never kept the continuity of the character except ah, for a couple yeah, times. That's right. Because there is one where um you are dealing with the department store clerk and his wife. They work mm. in the same store and he it's I think it's paint oil paints or watercolor paints. Um uh, <laughs> and then by the end of it Mel goes off to have a break and it's his wife. And I'm trying to remember who played the wife. It might've been B. Benedict. I, I think it was. It was. Right. Yeah. Right. So B. Benedict handles uh, the transaction for Jack. Yes. And then she goes <laughs> like, you drove my Mel crazy, but you're not going to drive me crazy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my I, God. Like, I love it. I love it. And, and it was so dark. And yet because of the comedy acting ability on that TV episode. And I think on one of the radios, they did the gunshot, but it was more effective for once. For once, it was more effective oh on TV. God, you know how the vault is more effective on radio? Yes. This this was the reverse where he went off, but he did it off screen. And it was mm -hmm. the comic timing of, of not only the huge bang, and then, but then he yeah. coming back and saying, oh, what a shame. And he was such a nice young man. And then getting a double laugh by reaching into the cash register and taking his own change. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those things where we talk about the difference between the television show and the radio show. I absolutely agree. The television right. show does it better. It's like, it's it's constructed beautifully Beautiful. from blocking yeah. on down to shooting it. Yeah. If you 
if you guys look on YouTube, that re- episode is readily available. But it's yeah, and it was done in 1960. Strangely enough, it was done late in 60, only only like a month and a half before Mel had that dreadful car crash that almost killed him and he's at his peak he's at his prime he's doing cartoons and he's got the energy he's still looking like a middle-aged little guy who's so harmless at the beginning of the skit and and one of the big disappointments in my life is that they did the same exact script like three years before on the benny tv show but on videotape live and that one that episode hasn't turned up and i'd love to just see if there's a few wrinkles in the performance that's different uh in that um three year before like 1957 we have to keep an eye out for that and mm, intrepid yeah. intrepid users. But Keith, um, we'll we'll end it on the the clip of the train announcer. But before that, thank you so much oh, for coming pleasure. for coming over to Zoom Land for us to talk about your love of Mel Blanc. Um, I can speak for uh, I can speak for myself one once more on a very important point. This book right here, Cartoon Voices of the Golden Age. Get thank it. you, thank you, thank this you very is, much. This is the resource, folks, and this is the man who is the resource. Thank you so much, Keith, my friend. I well, that's that's a pleasure, and and uh, I'm just honoured for, for to be the second time in my life to be on the Jack Benny convention because the Jack Benny radio program in particular has been a part of my life since 1970, and uh, that's a long, long time. That's over over half a century of Jack Benny uh, informing my life with comedy, and and uh, and I just love the fact that he reached the grand old age just before he passed and still was able to do the cheap jokes. I remember on one, there was one roast, I think he did where they were roasting Bob Hope and and it, like fictionally, but Bob Hope had apparently just done a movie where with Joey Heatherton and Jack says, and, and he's running through a field of flowers in the nude. <laughs> now, now I wouldn't do that for a thou a hundred dollars. <laughs> he got away with that joke at the age of like 80. <laughs> yeah. It, he he had a way of he had a way of keeping that it, it, it mm. speaks to that we saw that um uh we saw that he died at the age of 80 but he always he never felt 80 anytime I no, look at the no, at the track right. record of the specials never looked 80 he always looked no, 80, no. you know. Just that very last one that that went to air posthumously on the Lucille Ball roast you could tell he'd he declined a little bit because the power of his voice was suddenly very soft like that, you know, mm-hmm. and it was like, oh, okay, Jack's not well. And very soon after that, he died. And, and then they they put it to air with a special thing where Dean Martin and Lucille Ball introduced the episode and said, this is our tribute to Jack, who's just passed, you know. But uh, boy, what a career and such a such a pleasure to be here. I know I'm going to take putting you over and all of that. So I'll I'll just say uh, on behalf of Jack and Mel Blank and all of you wonderful people and, and Laura and everybody there and Gasman's. That's all, folks. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. And on that note, Mr. Gasman, why don't we hear a little bit of the. Well, there we go. well, I don't know. That was Monday. We now bring you up to Wednesday. Same story. Now look, mister, you've examined them both very carefully. Haven't you made up your mind yet? Gee, I... I don't know which one I want. That was Wednesday. We now bring you up to Saturday. Same story. <clears throat> Gosh, I... I wish you hadn't shown me both of them. Let me see that first one again, will you? Look, mister, I got a wife and five kids. <laughs> I haven't been home in a week. Now make up your mind, will you? Gosh, I, I can't decide. This one looks nicer, but the, the other seems to be more durable. Oh, Jack, for heaven's sake, shoelaces are shoelaces. <laughs> Mary, when you're buying a gift for somebody, you don't rush into things. Now let's see, if I take the... Oh, pardon me. Hello? Yes? Oh, thanks. Thanks for telling me. Goodbye. Gee, it's so hard. Look, to... mister, I want to go home. I got six kids now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, congratulations. A new baby. Do you mind if I buy something for the little fellow? No. No, why don't you buy him a razor? <laughs> a razor? Yeah, by the time you pick it out, he'll be old enough to use it. <laughs> hmm. That's an old joke. It was new when we came in here. Well, look, mister, I'll take these shoelaces, the, the shorter ones. Oh, 
thank heavens. Now do you want the metal tips or the plastic tips? <laughs> Here we go again. I'll take the plastic ones. The metal ones rust. You're right, Jack. But of course, you know, the plastic ones crash. Oh. Well, then wait a minute. Uh, let me see. If that phone rings again, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. <laughs> all right, all right. Give me the metal one. Yes, sir. Oh, here we are, Mary. Here's the notion counter. Oh, say, mister. Yes? About the shoelaces I bought. Oh, yes, yes. I've got them all wrapped up. Here you are. Well, I've been thinking about the plastic tips. And I think the metal tips would be much better. No. No. No, no. No. But all I, all I want to do is change them. Change them. Change them, he says. This can't be happening to me. This must be a dream. Look, mister. I've always been a good man. Always did the right thing. Look, mister. Worked oh. hard in the store. A loyal employee. Look, clerk. I... When the Christmas season started... They gave us our choice of departments. I know. I could have had any counter I wanted. But I took shoelaces. Look. Shoelaces! And why? Because I thought it would be easy. Simple. Mister. Metal tips. Plastic tips. And we've got rubber tips, too. But I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> All right, here. Uh, oh, there's a crowd forming. Let's get out of here. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Keith. <laughs>